Welcome to Miss Hell, a place where we dive deep into the dark and twisted world of female true crime. Grab a cup of tea and prepare to be shocked and intrigued by these amazing cases. Atropa belladonna, or deadly nightshade, holds rich symbolism. Belladonna's purple flowers stand for silence or falsehood. To the Victorians, a gift of belladonna might be interpreted as a warning, a symbol of death or a meditation on the nature of good and evil. However, the Amaryllis belladonna is believed to mean pride, strength and determination. How else could I describe a nine-year-old who crawled out of poverty using the only thing the streets taught her? Regardless, the price paid to open the doors of wealth and status was imbued with the smell of death and burning flesh at every step. In today's episode, we will uncover the facts surrounding Catherine Monvoisin's life and the crimes that immortalised her in history. Born in France around 1640, Catherine Monvoisin grew up in a time when superstitions and belief in witchcraft strongly pervaded society. Details about her early life remain scarce. However, it is believed that Catherine was born into a lower middle-class family, which made it difficult to rise above the financial hardships that plagued her. When she was a small girl, you could find her roaming the streets of Paris selling fortunes to nobles for a few pounds. The struggles of poverty made her turn to a life of crime. At the tender age of 20, she married Antoine Monvoisin, a merchant whose unreliability swiftly became apparent. Plunged into the abyss of her husband's failing business and staggering debts, Catherine was confronted with a difficult choice return to the poverty of the streets or carve her own path to survival. She did what any enterprising young woman with a skill for palm reading and a basic understanding of the dark arts did in those days. She delved into the shadowy realm of poison mastery. To enhance her allure and credibility, she spared no expense in crafting an ambiance conducive to belief. Notably, she acquired a special robe of crimson red velvet embroidered with gold eagles for a price of 15,000 livres to perform in. Around 1666, her fortune-telling was questioned by the priests of St Vincent de Paul's order, but Catherine was clever and uncompromising. She convinced the vicars and professors of theology at Sorbonne University that any divination skills she possessed were given to her by God. She simply used psychology and her faith to help people in need. They bought it, and Catherine's business, now seemingly endorsed by the church, began to flourish. During her work as a fortune teller, she noticed the similarities between her customers' wishes. Almost all wanted to have someone fall in love with them, that someone would die so that they might inherit, or that their partners would die so that they might marry someone else. The art of poisoning had become a regular science at the time, having been perfected in part by Giulia Tofana, a professional female poisoner in Italy, only a few decades before Catherine. Catherine was interested in science and alchemy, and financed several private projects and enterprises. She was known to suffer from alcoholism and was immersed in several conflicts with her rival, the poisoner Marie Boss. This is a key element in her story. Being an excellent business opportunist, she took advantage of the harsh life of those times and opened a home for unwed mothers, helping women with unwanted pregnancies procure abortions or helping lower-class ladies get rid of their babies after childbirth. She didn't charge her peasant clientele for these services, instead extra-billing aristocratic women who came to her for help in order to pay for her charity. These were women who couldn't afford the scandal of a child out of wedlock or women who simply couldn't afford to raise a child on the unforgiving streets of Paris in the 17th century. Catherine might have told them she'd find homes for the children, or she might have told them nothing at all. As her reputation and notoriety grew, she formed a secretive order known as La Voisin. This clandestine society specialised in witchcraft, poisoning and black magic. Here, Catherine found a platform where she could exploit her intelligence and sinister inclinations. She quickly established herself as an accomplished poisoner and began designing deadly potions to eliminate those who stood in her path. Throughout this time, she remained a high-profile socialite and her sheer charm made no one suspect her. 
La Voisin employed the help of priests, some of whom were her lovers, to perform satanic rituals in the catacombs underneath her home. These black masses were dark inversions of a traditional Catholic ritual in which a naked woman would act as an altar. The most famous of these black masses was performed for Madame de Montespan around 1672. Montague Summers, a great classical author on the occult, gives a description of one such ritual. A long black velvet pole was spread over the altar, and upon this the royal mistress laid herself in a state of perfect nudity. Six black candles were lit. The celebrant robed himself in a chasuble embroidered with esoteric characters wrought in silver. The gold paten and chalice were placed upon the naked belly of the living altar. And then, all was silent. An assistant crept forward bearing an infant in her arms. The child was held over the altar, a sharp gash across the neck, a stifled cry, and warm drops fell into the chalice and streamed upon the white figure beneath. The corpse was handed to Catherine, who flung it callously into an oven fashioned for that purpose which glowed white hot in its fierceness. Whether the baby needed to be alive or not, I'm not sure. But procuring a child for the services, as you know, wasn't difficult for Catherine. She had a constant supply of sacrifices, thanks to her philanthropy and to the unforgiving standards of Catholicism at the time. The day she met Madame de Montespan is the day her collapse began. The black mass she paid for was for the love and attention of King Louis XIV of France, and it was successful. After the black mass, she became the official mistress. However, in time, the king became disinterested in her. In 1677, Montespan made it clear that if the king should abandon her, she would have him killed. The affair of the poisons was a scandal, and a big, profitable trend. However, it had way too many loopholes. As soon as one of the people involved was caught, all the rest followed. The downfall began in 1676, with the trial of Madame de Branvilliers, a wealthy aristocrat, who was accused of working with her lover to murder her father and brothers so that she could inherit his estate. This landmark trial attracted significant public attention due to the sensational nature of the crimes committed. King Louis XIV, terrified he might also become a victim of poisoning, gave the chief of the Paris police permission to conduct a witch hunt. When the king entered into a relationship with Angélique de Fontange in 1679, Montespan called for La Voisin and asked her to have both the king and Fontange killed. Catherine hesitated, but was eventually convinced to agree. The plan was to murder the king by poisoning a petition, delivered to his own hands. The police didn't have much evidence, until one night when Marie Boss drunkenly boasted about how rich the poisonous business made her. This led to her arrest and, under torture, she declared that Madame de Montespan paid the witch La Voisin for a potion to make the king love her. It is said that for 13 years the king's food was tainted with a mixture that included drained blood and mashed baby bones. With this new bit of information revealed, La Voisin was destined to burn at the stake for witchcraft. Her death to set an example for the women of the court and the necromancers and fortune tellers doing business in Paris. She died in early 1680 after the fiery court, found her guilty and worthy of one of the harshest punishments the court could deal out. But she didn't go quietly. Some say she begged for mercy from the crowd, some say she shouted her innocence, and others say she cursed the families of each of the men responsible for her verdict. Implicated in the affair of the poisons were 442 suspects. 367 orders of arrests were issued, of which 218 were carried out. Of the condemned, 36 were executed, 5 were sentenced to the galleys, and 23 to exile. This excludes those who died in custody by torture or suicide. In the aftermath of the Poisons affair, Madame de Montespan was replaced by Madame de Maintenon as the official royal mistress. In 1681, Angelique suffered a high fever, and according to some sources, she gave birth prematurely to a stillborn girl in March. The Duchess died soon after. She was not yet 20 years old. The King expressed the wish that there be no autopsy, 
However, at the request of her family, one was performed. The doctors found that her lungs were in appalling condition, with the right one, in particular, being full of purulent matter, while her chest was flooded with fluid. Even though the death was declared to be of natural causes by several doctors, the rumours of poisoning echoed throughout the kingdom. Most of the French nobility, including Montespan, escaped punishment thanks to King Louis XIV, who worried if people learned the truth, that his court was teeming with liars, murderers and practitioners of witchcraft. The peasant class would rebel, or worse. England would use the scandal as a reason to invade. And so, for a time, Catherine Montvoisin, a murderer, fortune teller, street rat, entrepreneur, high priestess, prisoner, and yes, a witch, was perhaps even more powerful than the king himself. Her case represented a pivotal moment in criminal history, shedding light on the use of poisons as a means of murder, which had far-reaching implications for forensic sciences. Additionally, her story has been immortalised through various fictional adaptations, including novels, plays and films, perpetuating the fascination with her villainous character. If you enjoyed this dive into the macabre, make sure to like, share and subscribe for more intriguing stories from the depths of the human experience.